Good morning, everyone. A warm welcome to you all. A warm welcome to everyone as we gather here for worship in Moldworth this morning. Good to see the meeting house filling and um, people back with us. We want to keep encouraging others if you're watching online and, and uh, maybe otherwise could be here. We'd love to have you back. And this coming Easter period might be a good time just to take that step of coming back here regularly with us on a Sunday morning. We'd love to have you uh, as part of that. Um, we're going to, we have a, a number of announcements today, so let me get right into them. They'll take a wee moment or two, you just bear with me. Just reminding you tonight, we continue with our evening service at half past six, and we continue looking at the book of James on that occasion, letter of James. Uh, we meet for our Bible study and, and prayer time on Wednesday evening in the Old Manse. Uh, so growth groups were last week, the regular Bible study prayer time this week, and we're continuing a little series on the prophecy of Nahum in our Wednesday evening meetings. And then, God willing, we meet again uh, next Lord's Day at the at the planned times of 11.30 and 6. Uh, then to say this, uh, you see there that the notice that at the Presbyterian Church's General Council meeting this past week, a uh, decision was taken to lift all remaining restrictions on churches concerning COVID-19. And that means really as from tomorrow officially uh, that no longer are the masks required, the distancing, all, all the things that have been part of, of uh, the, the regulations for the last while. And that includes during singing. So we're meant to, to keep the masks on today while we sing, but officially then from next week, that's not required. That being said, we're conscious that there's a wide range of feeling about all of this in the community. Some people have been gasping to get rid of the, 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 the restrictions and others are very cautious about being rid of restrictions. So therefore, it's always up to the individual as to whether you want to wear a mask or not wear a mask, whether you want to sit somewhere at a greater distance. We, we leave that to your, to your choice. But the main thing is we're just delighted to have people here. Um, again, then something else, a, a few members of our congregation indicate they're concerned to respond in practical ways to help Ukrainian families who might be relocated here uh, from those refugees who have been fleeing the war. And uh, we'd said last week we would hold a short meeting after this morning service just to establish who it would be, folks who are interested. And that may range from you being someone who has already registered to offer your home uh, as a place of refuge for a, a family or an individual, or just somebody who wants in a, a, maybe a, in a more low-key way to be able to help in practical ways if, if we find that there are people coming uh, to Cookstown from uh, the, the war situation there in Ukraine. So that meeting, if those who are interested, if you meet just afterwards here in the in the back room, here in the minister's room, just behind, I think it's a good place to gather where you'll not be disturbed from everything else that's happening after church. The Easter outreach, we've been uh, collecting names of people willing to help with that. Just, you can see the details. We, we, we're now going to have that a little door-to-door -door outreach, bringing some, bringing a little gift and bringing some gospel literature on Tuesday evening, the 12th of April, on a meeting in the Old Manse at 7 p.m. Uh, and we collect the materials then, have a, have a short time of prayer and move out, a cup of tea afterwards. So that's the plan for that evening. Uh, there's 
you can see the details up and coming for Easter. I'll just leave those with you. Words of thanks uh, are also there on the, the bulletin to those who donated very generously to the Ukraine appeal and, and really most more before that to Maud's uh, support uh, going to Africa. Maud, by the way, is back in Kampala and uh, she begins her journey home, a bit back home Tuesday morning, I think. So that's the plan. That all has gone well by way of getting out of Congo again and uh, she just needs to make the journey home. Uh, you'll also see a thank you to those who donated to the, the 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 small cycling team fundraiser that was happening yesterday along the the north coast and uh again words of thanks to those who support it through the the the, the online donations to that uh the pw have holding a dinner tuesday the 12th of april in the royal hotel and all ladies welcome to attend that and they see the cost there and you can sign on the sheet in the porch if you're hoping to come along to that a um, couple of other things then, just not, not well, three other things actually not printed in the sheet. First of all, to say that copies of the Presbyterian Herald, I'm told, are available today in the porch. I, I, they weren't there earlier when I was there, but I presume they're, they're there now. Uh, and uh, those are there to collect. There's also a, a big table there with some books on it. Uh, in fact, two tables with books on it. And I've been preaching on the whole issue of creation and uh, the whole issue of, of, of biblical view of creation as opposed to evolution. There's a number of books there, and they're not to buy. They're, they're, to, they're to either take for free or to borrow. So on the, the smaller table, there are some leaflets, uh, smaller type leaflets, and maybe small books, and actually some free DVDs there you can take on the smaller table. The stuff on the larger table ranges from little books like this to, to bigger books if you're up to a bit of time to read over Easter time. Uh, these are made available to us actually by, by Johnny Marcus. We're very grateful to Johnny for this. It's a, it's a little library of books that he had, he had available. And... Uh, if you're if you're taking one of the borrow books, the ones on the big table, you simply write your name on the sheet of paper, and there's a number in the back of the book. Write the number of the book, so we know who has it. That's the, that's the idea. We'll make those available for a couple of weeks, just for folks to borrow if you want to read a little bit over Easter time. And you did you can keep them for a few weeks. You can keep them and bring them back in a week or two's time. And if you forget to bring them back, we will we know who you are and where to find you. Uh, and uh, we'll send the boys round. Okay, okay. So there you go. Uh, those are those are there for you to, to borrow. Um, okay, um, I think, yes, just one more thing then, and that is the, the, the outcome of our election of, of ruling elders. Now, following the recent nominations by the congregation and then a process of selection by the Kirk session, the result of that is that six men have agreed to accept the call to become ruling elders, and they are as follows. Uh, we didn't have all the details finalized in time just to, to go to print with this, but they are as follows in alphabetical order of surname. Jonathan Coulter, Fergus Ferguson, Lawrence Knox, Edward Lennox, Darren McKee, and Johnny Marcus. Now, four others who also selected declined the opportunity to serve at the present time. There's now two further steps that need to be taken before the election of these men is ratified. The first is this. Uh, having this morning read to you the list of those selected and having uh, obtained their consent, under paragraph 1792 of the code, there's a two-week period given from today when the code says, should any voter desire to make any objection to any of them, he shall lodge his objections with his reasons in writing with the moderator of Kirk Session. I'm the moderator of Kirk Session. Then, if there are no objections and during that period, on a subsequent date, which probably will be Sunday the 1st of May, a congregational meeting of voting members will be held following the morning service and a secret ballot taken in the form of a yes-no vote with a view to individually affirming the call of these men to the eldership. But formal notice about that meeting will be given in the course of this month when we're just clear that, that the other uh, procedure has, has completed satisfactorily. So that's the names again, just read them once more. Jonathan Coulter, Fergus Ferguson, Lawrence Knox, Edward Lennox, Darren McKee, and Johnny Marcus. And we commend those men to your prayers and to your encouragement uh, for these days ahead. Now that's the announcements we come to worship the Lord. And uh, these words uh, we find in Psalm 65, often we sing them. But this morning we read them, praise is due to you, O God in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed. O you who hear prayer, to you all flesh shall come, 
when iniquities prevail against thee, you atone for our transgressions. Blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your, holy, of your temple. By awesome deeds you answer us with righteousness, O God of our salvation. We sing now to God's praise uh, this song. Lift high the name of Jesus, Jesus our King. Make known the power of his grace, the beauty of his peace. great and mighty God, our sovereign Lord and our creator. We rejoice in being in this place of worship this morning where your name is honored and uplifted. And whereas we've just done a moment ago, we have praised the name of your wonderful son and our glorious savior, Jesus Christ. How good to know uh, of him and of all he has done for us, of his taking our humanity and bearing our sins in his own body on the tree at Calvary, and in dying for those sins, bearing our just judgment, and rising again victorious to bring us life. These are the things at the heart of the gospel, and we thank you for them, because as we have looked at this issue of creation, and how you made everything, Lord, that was very good and perfect in the beginning, how different as the reality today because of human sinfulness and how deeply we see the marks of the fallenness of man in our own hearts and souls. We can quickly and readily rage and frustrate against the sins of this world that appall us at times and the wickedness and evil that abounds in so many places. And yet then we have to turn and 
Shine the light of your word, Lord, into our own hearts and souls and see there what deeply flawed people we are too. Flawed not because you made us badly, but because our sin has corrupted that which was your good creation. And we know that that fallenness spreads into every area area of our being. There's nothing we can do that is perfectly good in your sight and therefore that pleases you, but everything, even the, the motives of our hearts are tainted with our rebellion and our personal pride and our desire to exalt ourselves above you, our desire to think ourselves better than other people. We pray your forgiveness, Lord, for such a, for the, for the pride of our hearts this morning and for the willfulness of our sins and the unholiness of our actions. And Lord, just how often then we've not only done the wrong thing, we failed to do the good thing we knew should be done. We failed to uh, walk in the paths of righteousness and we failed uh, to love our neighbor as we, as we should. So in our failure to love you, Lord, and our failure to love our neighbor, we confess our need of mercy this morning and of pardon and of forgiveness. We pray you will grant those to us when we come with a repentant heart. But Lord, that is the grace that we need, that grace of repentance this morning, because how easy we know it is to come week after week to church, even for years and years, and never truly have a repentant heart before you, the living God. May that not be the case today, but may anyone and everyone who hears the word of God today confess their sins freely and find mercy and forgiveness and, and salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord. For in his name we pray. Amen. Okay, if you go to the Bibles, then we're going to Genesis again. Uh, back to the back to part of what we've read before on more than one occasion, but then we're reading right into chapter two. So Genesis one, we're beginning at verse twenty six, because we are still thinking this morning, as I said we would do last time, about the whole issue of bearing the image of God and the likeness of God, and that. But we're going to read from verse twenty six of chapter one right through the whole of chapter two. So this is the word of God. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the, all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon and it is the one that 
uh, flowed around the whole land of Avila, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Bedelium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you shall eat of it, you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that God, the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Amen. We know God will bless the reading of his precious word. Boys and girls, a moment or two to speak to you this morning. If you'd like to come up, that's good. If you want to stay where you are, that's okay as well. But if you come down here, I'll have a wee word with you. Um, some more coming, we'll wait for them. Great. Super. Okay, we're ready for everybody now. Now, we've been thinking in church last week, I was asking a question. I was asking on Mother's Day, did anybody look like their mother or their dad? And some people said, yeah, I look like my mom. I know you did. And others said, no, I prefer to look like my dad. Because that's what it's like in a family. We, we, we do look like each other. And we said that one of the really important things is that God made us to look, well, not to look so much, because we, we don't really know what God looks like. Because God, but we said we said, but we know Jesus became a man. But God made us to be like him. Bible says he made us like him. He gave us his image. That is, he wanted us to begin to be and to live as the kind of way he would be. And remember, we thought about how God, God, God is loving and God is truthful and all those things. And we wondered, are we really like that? Well, I want to think a wee bit more about that this morning. And to remember that when God says he made people to be like him and to be special to him, because we're more special to God than, than any of the other animals or birds or fish or anything else that has life. People, boys and girls and growing ups are very special to God. But the really important thing we're going to remember this morning, and, and we're going to say that a little bit to the, the, the grown ups about this as well, is that people are special to God no matter where they come from in whatever part of the world. Now, you may have boys and girls in your class at school who maybe have come to Cookstown from other countries. And, uh, or certainly their mums and dads come from other countries. Anybody got somebody in your class that comes from another, another country in the world? Do you know? Yeah. From Ukraine. You got somebody from Ukraine in your class, right? Okay, good. And anybody else got somebody? Yeah. Uh, where, 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 does, where, do they, where does that people come from? Do you know they come from another country? 
Well, I, I know there's for sure there's people come from places like Portugal and Czech Republic and Poland and Latvia and Slovakia and Lithuania and, and, and USA and Russia as well. Don't forget about them. And we even, we even have a Russian in church as well. Uh, and from other countries further away than that, because all those, most of those countries, except the USA, all those countries are in Europe, but some come from places in Africa. I know we have people from Mozambique and people from Guinea-Bissau. We have people who come from away the other side of the world in a place called East Timor. And other people who've come in the other direction have come to live here from Brazil. Yeah. Hollywood. I thought Hollywood County down or Hollywood, California. Maybe California. <laughs> yeah. And Korea. Do you know someone from Korea? Hmm. That's interesting. And of course, not only do they come from other places, sometimes they look the same as us. Other times they look different from us because their skin is darker or whatever. And maybe especially because they can also speak another language. Uh, how many languages do you speak? You speak French. <laughs> Tell me some French this morning. Bonjour. Comment allez-vous aujourd'hui? I see a bit. You say, très bien. Uh, anyway, okay. You speak French. Good man. Now, I was talking to somebody this week, and they told me that they came five years ago from Lithuania. They spoke absolutely perfect English. They even spoke with a Cookstown accent. That's hard. And they also told me that they can speak Russian, and they can speak German. They can speak four languages. It's amazing. And uh, that's, what, that's, what, that's what it is. There's lots and lots and lots of people with different languages here in our own town, and especially across the world. I don't know how many languages are, are people speak in Cookstown. I don't know, there might be 12 languages, a dozen, I don't know, certainly from a lot of different countries. Do you know there's a country in the world, away on the other side of the world, called Papua New Guinea, and there's 832 different languages in that one country. Amazing. I know we were in Australia for a Where? Australia. Australia. Yeah, except in Australia, a lot of people speak English there and all these other languages because Australia is full of people from all, all sorts of different countries. But why I'm telling you all this is that no matter which part of the world you come from, no matter what you look like, no matter what language you speak, God has made every person to have his likeness and his image. And God wants everybody to look to him and trust him and follow him. And here's the special thing. When God sent Jesus to die for people's sins and to give them the gift of eternal life by trusting in him, Jesus died and gave his life for people in every single part of the world. And God's plan is to bring boys and girls and grown-ups from every single country in the world, with every different language, with every different color of skin, to be part of heaven in the end of the day. So people can get to heaven, no matter where they come from, by the same way you can by asking Jesus to be your savior. So here's a verse to, in the Bible to help us remember that. Here's what, in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, the man who wrote this book, God let him have a wee look into heaven to see what it was like there. And in his vision of heaven, John said, I looked, and there was a huge number of people, a great number of people. There were so many people in heaven, I couldn't count them. But here's where they came from, from every nation from every country in the world, from every tribe. Now, what's a tribe? A tribe's just like a, a smaller group of people within a nation. I've got a little thing in my phone here. I might tell the grown-ups about this. Here's something here. I've got a thing here in my phone that helps, reminds me every day to pray for people from some part of the world who haven't heard about Jesus. And every day it gives you a country that you've heard of, but it maybe tells you about people, you've, a tribe you've never heard of before but it's asking you to pray for them because they need to hear about Jesus. It's called Unreached of the Day. So anybody interested in that, you've got a mobile phone, you can download that, yeah? It's not a mobile phone, it's a Samsung. It's just, <laughs> mine's better than a Samsung, so there you are. Mine's a Xiaomi. There you are, all the way from China. Anyway, <laughs> there you go. So here's these people in heaven. Where did they come from? 
from every country, from every people, and every language. And what were they doing? They were standing before God's throne and before the Lamb, before Jesus Christ. So God wants to bring you to heaven, asking you to, to ask Jesus to be your Savior and to come into your life. And God's saying the same thing to boys and girls all across the world so that one day in heaven, not everybody will be there, but only people who trust in Jesus. But it doesn't matter where they come from. God it loves people all across the world and wants them to know about Jesus. He might want you someday to go to somewhere else in the world and tell people about Jesus. We're going to pray now, and then we're going to sing a song. We're going to pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for these boys and girls here in Molesworth this morning, and for all the friends they have at school, some of them coming from other countries in the world. And we thank you, Lord, that your love and the message of Jesus and the gospel is for all the boys and girls everywhere in the world. Help us, therefore, Lord, to remember to, to love people from every country and to pray for them and to tell them the good news about Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You have a big plan and a, a wonderful plan to bring people from every single country into your kingdom and to into the place of eternal life in heaven. Help us to tell the good news of Jesus wherever we go in his name. Amen. We want to sing a song here, which is about going to about about that how they the, the message of Jesus Christ is for everywhere, all across the earth. Okay, from the sun's rising to the sun's setting. When we sing this, after we sing it, you can go to children's church.
Okay, I'm going to take a moment or two to pray for people uh, in different situations today. We always want to remember when we have people in hospital to pray for them and, and those who are unwell in our congregation. We have wanted to pray for Maud who is resting today in Kampala and begins her journey home tomorrow. And then remembering those who have uh, answered the call to ruling eldership to be praying for them as a congregation as well at this time. Also just wanted to think about other, you know, it's good, I think, to remember, and often in the evening services, we focus on praying for places and work across the world. Also good to pray for people just in their daily work uh, in uh, here and here in Northern Ireland and, and the different roles people play. You know, often we've prayed in the, in the past two years for healthcare workers because they were so much in our minds. And sometimes we pray for security force people and so on as well. But just, uh, just in the uh, during the week, I was at a meeting in Belfast and just sitting beside a man who's retired, a, a fairly senior civil servant retired. Uh, I'm just reminded by him as I was chatting to him. He's a, he's a Christian and an elder in, in one of the churches in Belfast. And, you know, that, that he, here's someone who is having to come in and, and uh, work alongside those who govern the country. And in his department... Uh, whether he likes or agrees with the person who's the government minister at the, at the given time, he, his job is to do the help with the work of governance and be a Christian and be a light for Christ in that setting uh, in the civil service. Obviously, the civil service employs many, many people, but it was just, I was just reminded of that as we're coming into an election and we'll hear the, the many claims and the many promises of politicians over the next number of weeks as they look for your vote. Uh, but here are people who are going to have to work alongside those folks and, and administer the, the, the work of the country and do so maybe sometimes having to, to struggle for how does their Christian conviction fit into the, the work of governance uh, and, and uh, working alongside those who are, who are elected. So just to pray for people in that situation as well today, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the calling that you give to every single one of us in the places where we work. Some of us will go tomorrow, tomorrow morning into the schools, into the healthcare facilities, into the security work, uh, and, into the farms, into the factories, into the shops, wherever, Lord, you've placed us. Uh, and many of us may be too also into an office environment of some kind. We thank you, Lord, that in every situation, you call your people to be salt and light for Jesus Christ and there to manifest his love uh, and uh, evidence, Lord, of their faith. And we thank you, Lord, for how you enable people of, of, of saving faith in Christ to bring the righteousness of God into situations that otherwise would be ungodly. And we're praying especially this morning for those engaged working alongside government in the civil service. Remembering, Lord, that sometimes we, find that the, the, we may find the policies of those who govern not to our pleasing and it may be even something we disagree with. And yet here are people whose daily task is to administer and carry out government policy. We pray for your people in that situation and that, and that in those roles, they will be a, a light and a witness for Jesus Christ, even to those who are in the world of politics uh, and maybe are often people with strong opinions in one way or the other, praying, Lord, that those who serve you in that situation will have a powerful impact for the sake of Christ and the gospel. And then, Lord, remembering uh, the needs that are ongoing around us in our world, we, we cannot fail every week to pray for a peace to the, the conflict in Ukraine. And we, we thank you for the generosity of people who have given to that appeal recently. And we pray as that relief work continues, even as this little group meets after church today, to consider how they can better support the, uh, the, the refugee crisis that you will lead and guide them uh, in their deliberation. We pray too, Lord, uh, for those in our congregation today who are dealing with illness. Uh, some of those folks are, are long-term grappling with, with illnesses that, are that, that wear them down and, or give them disability and discomfort day after day, and they need much grace and strength to carry on, even if, even if they, a longer-term work of healing is not evident. There's others in hospital or just home from hospital who need that work of healing or who are just awaiting the surgery that's before them praying your presence and your peace with them and your healing touch. And often too, Lord, maybe if there's a spiritual need as well as a physical one, to pray, Lord, that you will meet them at this time of crisis in their lives with a new desire to know you and to call upon your name as their Lord and Savior. Lord, we remember too then with thankfulness our sister Maud as she uh, finishes this time in Africa and uh, 
rests today. We pray for your mercies and safety as she travels back home again over these next couple of days. Bless her and encourage her, we pray at this time. We remember also, Lord, those who have uh, been considering the work of eldership these last couple of weeks and for those who have agreed to step forward uh, in your will to offer themselves in your service. We pray for Jonathan and Fergus and Lawrence and Edward and Darren and Johnny that you will bless them and encourage them uh, in their walk with you every day and us as a congregation as we can uh, as we consider those that have we believe have the call of God upon their lives. Lord, undertake for them and uh, and encourage them in their hearts and make them powerful in your service, we pray. Lord, for every one of our needs, we have we come here with unspoken need this morning as well as needs that we've mentioned publicly. There's issues we grapple with day and daily. There's issues that are maybe just fresh and very pressing on our, on our hearts and minds and in our family life at the present time. And you know what those needs are, but we want silently in prayer just to unburden our hearts before you now, Lord, and to tell you what weighs us down, what makes us anxious, what makes us fearful, and to ask God for your help your answers to prayer, your peace, your strength, your grace for what's ahead. Hear us, Lord, indeed, as we call upon you. And give us faith to keep praying on in expectation of answered prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> okay, we're going to sing a, a song now, which we may have only sung once in church before, but there's this song and another one that I, I asked Sam if he would Help us to, to learn these this, coming into Easter time because uh, these songs help us. They're new songs that, that focus very much upon the work of, of God and Christ uh, uh, dealing with our sins uh, uh, and he offering his mercy to us. This one here this morning, what love could remember, no wrongs we have done, omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their songs. Sam, give us a bit of the tune for that maybe first of all, and then we'll, we'll, we'll be try and stand, stand and sing it together. Some of us will know it, I know but we, we, the rest of us will learn it. Sins they are many, His mercy is more. Sins they are many, His 
We pray again before we come to the word of God. Lord, grant to us now that hearing of your word and understanding of your word, that this word is not just a story from of old, but the living word of God, ever present in Holy Scripture for our hearts today, speaking into our need and challenging us at the point of our need. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. That short statement in verse 27 of Genesis 1 contains the key to understanding so many of the questions that people have about human life. Why are we here? What does it mean to be human? What's the purpose of my life? All these great profound questions that people have puzzled over for centuries begin to find their answer in this verse and in the verses that both follow and precede it in the book of Genesis. That's why we take these first few chapters of Genesis really seriously and we take time with them we don't write them off as some piece of ancient mythology. We don't pass them off as some would want to do as mere poetry and poetic imagery. We view them as the literal word of the living God. His inspired account of the creation of the universe and of the world we live in. Now, last week, we took only a brief look at these verses of 26 and 27 of Genesis 1 to list a few th ways in which we as humans display the image of God and the things that set us apart and distinct from all the other animal life that God created. This morning, I want us to look a little more fully at both the issue of God's creation of man as male and female, and also some of the important implications of the fact that we are made in his likeness. You'll notice if you've read carefully through the, the verses we, we were on this morning, that in chapter 2, you actually have the story of creation, the creation of man told over again in a different kind of way from a different angle. Chapter 1 provides the chronological account of the six days of creation and, and shows man as the pinnacle of God's creation, given dominion over everything else that God has created. Chapter 2, on the other hand, provides more detail in how exactly men and women were created. And, the places, and places them, humanity, as central to everything that God is doing. So two complementary accounts, each giving us insight into God's purpose in creation and, the, and particularly the creation of human beings. What do we want to, to look at this morning? Three or four things I want you to notice. The first of them is this. This would be a, a, a strange place to start, but it's, it's worth saying this. The importance of our bodies. In verse 7 of, of Genesis 2, we read these words. The Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. What does that tell us? It tells us, firstly, that God made us out of matter, that he had already created out of the dust of the ground. Uh, we're made of the same basic elements that are found in the earth, such as calcium and carbon and nitrogen and hydrogen and oxygen and so on, to name but a few. And that is a fact not only indicated here in Genesis, of course, it's also confirmed by science. However, the Lord did not create man and leave him as an inanimate object, obviously. The second part of the verse tells us he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being, or the King James Bible would say a living soul. That's a very significant statement because it tells us that God not only created the human body, but he gave to it the principle of life. If the first man 
were, and women for that matter, were simply a creature that had evolved from another animal, whether it was an ape or whatever it was, the principle of life would already have been present in that animal. But that's not what the Bible teaches here. God teaches us in the scriptures that he very specifically created man uniquely in his image and gave to him at that very point of his creation the ability to live. He breathed into him the breath of life and the man became a living being. But I made this point uh, to also underline, as I said, the importance of our bodies. It is the human body that receives the breath of life, which, and it's a human body that's made in God's image, not only, not just the human spirit or soul. And the importance of the human body is one of the things that marks out Christianity, in fact, from a number of other world religions. There are other religions in the world that see salvation if you want to call it that, in terms of the soul one day being set free, liberated from the physical body, which, is, which gets sick and dies and so on, and they see, therefore, the body as of no ultimate value. Christianity, however, sees value in our physical bodies as something made by God and bearing his image, and it teaches us that God's purpose in salvation, in redemption, is not only to redeem our souls from sin, but our bodies as well. Because the great final hope of the Christian is that there will be a day of resurrection when the Lord Jesus returns. And the bodies of those who have died in Christ, maybe long since decayed in the grave, but they will be raised to life. They will be made new. We'll be given bodies that are fitted for the presence of Christ in glory. And this is also why then the Apostle Paul, when he lays out that very, very well-known call to Christian discipleship, this is how he expresses it in Romans 12 and verse 1. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Not just give your soul to God, give your body and everything it does as a living sacrifice to God. Our physical bodies designed and made by God and bearing his image are not of secondary value. They're not something to be treated with scant regard. And that's why Christians, of course, Ought, and ought to be concerned about the ways in which people sometimes abuse their bodies. Now, the Christian knows that the Bible teaches, doesn't it, for the, 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 the Christian, that their body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's what you read in, in 1 Corinthians 6. And in 1 Corinthians 6, it says that's, for example, why uh, in the particular context of that chapter, Christians should flee from sexual immorality, from the wrong use of our bodies. But it's also true for everyone, whether you're a Christian or whether you're not, that you are made in God's image and you ought to have regard for your body and what you do with it. And that's why, therefore, we have a massive concern when, there, when throughout our community and throughout our land, there are those who peddle Drugs, for example, of various kinds of drugs that are illegal, drugs that are harmful, drugs that utterly destroy both the mind and the body. And that would also include even drugs that are legal and, and freely for sale, like nicotine and alcohol. Because we are concerned about bearing the image of God in our minds and our souls and our bodies as well, it will affect what we think about the whole issue of pornography. That's another massive problem in society. And it's something the devil uses to pollute the mind, the heart, the soul, and ultimately the body of the individual. It, one of the things we're going to be thinking about in, when we come to the letter of James even this evening is, what do we do with this little tiny bit of our body <laughs> that's right inside our mouths all the time? And, the, some, and some of us doesn't shut up very often. Our little tongues... How do we use that? Do we use it to communicate with people or do we use it to slander them, to gossip about them, to lie about them, whatever? 
regularly we are confronted with the question, how are, how are we using the body which God the Creator gave us and that he made in his image for his glory? That's the question, the importance of our bodies. Second thing and uh, is this, the importance of our sexuality. Now, I know we touched on this somewhat last week in addressing some of the issues that were raised by transgenderism. We saw from verse 21 of Genesis 1 that God specifically designed the human race to have two distinctly complementary forms, male and female. In the past, we'd have said, that's just obvious. You take that for granted. What's the big deal today? I'm afraid it is a big deal. And as we read on into chapter 2, you get a specific account of how God created the first woman. We read about that, taking a rib from the first man, Adam. And God did that to provide Adam with a suitable helper. And so these opening chapters of Genesis have quite a lot of important things to teach us about marriage and about the role of men and women and so on. And that's something we come back to in a, in a later message. But for this morning, just two fundamental things to, to emphasize. Firstly, as we noted last time, men and women are equally made in God's image after God's likeness. Men and women share equal standing in the sight of God. At the same time, it is clear that men and women were made to be different from one another and therefore to complement one another. And that's something I think is emphasized in Scripture and that we really need to get hold of. The idea that, you know, we, we, that, that, that men and women are just totally the same except for some small matters of biology, that, that's not the way God made us. In making humans male and female, God was making two people who would be equal in his sight but not identical to one another but that would match and would complement one another and that, and that would be for ultimately for the lifelong union, one with the other in, in marriage. But the second thing to say about our sexuality is this, that marriage is what we sometimes call a creation ordinance. So it's something that was created and ordained by God from the beginning, this is something I always emphasize when we have a marriage service here in church. When we're bringing this man and woman into union at the union of marriage, we say this is something that God ordained right at the beginning. The secular world wants us to believe that marriage is what they call a social construct. In other words, marriage is just something that people invented somewhere along the, the role of human society. It's just something that, it's just a man-made idea. And therefore, if it's a man-made idea, you can either just get rid of it altogether and say, don't worry about marriage, just live together any way you please. Or you can say, if you don't believe it, that, uh, that, that marriage is made by God, you can then redefine it and reinvent it. That's why people who have no regard for the Bible view of marriage will say, well, What's the big deal about a same-sex marriage? Who says it has to be a man and woman? Who says it has to be one man or one woman? Why not have several in a polygamous marriage or relationship, multiple wives, multiple husbands? But the Bible view of marriage established at creation is always one man united to one woman in a lifelong union. Genesis 2.24, right at the end of the chapter, we read this and you hear this in the marriage service, don't you? For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and they will become one flesh. So marriage, a creation ordinance. Third thing we want to look at this morning is the importance again of our bearing God's image and some more things to say about that. We looked briefly last week at some ways in which our bearing God's image, as image as I said, sets us apart from other animals that God created. Not that we are the same as them at all, but, but obviously we are like other animals in the sense that we, have, we share similar types of organs and, uh, and, and we, have, we have life in us. But it goes beyond being that Genesis 1 and 2 shows us that people who bear God's image are charged with being his representatives to exercise dominion over the animals and over the earth, over the whole created world. God states that intent in verse 26 of Genesis 1, 
God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air of the heavens, over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And then after, after God creates man, he says in, in, in verse uh, 28, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then in chapter 2, where man is taken and is placed in this beautiful paradise of the Garden of Eden, there we are told he is placed in that garden not just to enjoy it, not just to admire it, but he's, we're told in verse 15 of Genesis 2 that God put man there in the Garden to, of Eden to work it and to keep it. So God's design for humanity is that they would have a productive role and they would exercise stewardship over God's creation. Now, does that have relevance for us today? It definitely does, doesn't it? Today, we have a very vocal and very powerful environmental lobby all kinds of groups ranging from Friends of the Earth right through to Extinction Rebellion and so on and so on. They're, they're on the news all the time. And those environmental groups are making all sorts of demands of government. And they're also, they're sowing an incredible amount of fear in the hearts of men and women, and especially of children, about the future of the planet. They want you to be terrified that our existence is about to end in a few years because of global warming or whatever. But so little of their hype is rooted in any kind of biblical concern for creation. It much more proceeds on the notion that we humans, we control the planet. We control the climate. We are our own destiny. And our greatest fear, therefore, should be environmental catastrophe. But a Christian concern for creation, which is a real concern, Proceeds so much more on the basis that we, under the sovereign rule of God for, over creation, we have been given dominion and stewardship over it. And therefore, we don't wreck creation, we don't exploit it, don't pollute it, and so on and so on. We are to care for it, but we are not to worship it. And that's the problem with the secular view of, 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 of the world we live in. Often it is a worship of the created world. And we should remember on this whole issue of catastrophe that having a lost soul, dead in sin and going to hell, is a far bigger catastrophe than having a supposedly warming planet. Secondly, we note that in bearing God's image, we have a particular dignity that should not be violated. Here it's important to remember as I was saying to the children earlier, that every human being bears God's image all of the time. No matter how much that image ever becomes obscured by our innate sinfulness. So as people bearing God's image, we need to have regard and respect for the image of God that is found in others. We must aim to avoid conduct that despises other people as being worthless or as being in some way perhaps less human than we are. Because that's what some of the worst dictatorships of the world have always done when they've, when they've had these pogroms of, of destruction and genocide and, uh, and ethnic cleansing and so on. They have said, here are people who are, are not even worthy of life. Let's, let's eradicate them. And even today, this, is, this has to be the biblical basis of proper race relations. The man or woman who speaks a different language, of whom, as I said, there are many in our town, is someone made in God's image. The man or woman with a black skin, a brown skin, a yellow skin is every bit as much God's image as a person with a white skin. And in fact, if any of those people from wherever in the world, if they are Christians, not only are they made in God's image, but they are also spiritually our brothers and sisters in Christ. We dare not despise people ever for the language they speak, the color of the skin, the country they come from, 
or indeed even for the religion that they practice. All people are made in God's image and bear a measure of dignity which we share with them and they with us. However, there's another crucial area in which our dignity as people made in God's image is really important. And that's in regard to the whole issue of the sanctity of human life. In Genesis 9, verse 6, God gave to Noah, after the time of the flood, he gave Noah the authority to do something that today is kind of looked down upon and, and in fact, despised in a lot of parts of the world. God gave humanity the authority to have a death penalty for a particular offense. What was that offense? The offense of murder. So God said to Noah in, in Genesis 9, verse 6, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made man. Because we are in God's image, you destroy God's image, you destroy the life of another person willfully, you have murdered them. And your life can be forfeited. Now, even in fallen sinful man, as is the case after Genesis 3. The image of God is there. And if anyone destroys human life, it's an attack on God's image. However, premeditated murder, we know, is one thing. We're all shocked and we're all horrified when that happens. What about the all-too-common practice of abortion? I know many of us here hold strong views against abortion. Maybe others of us aren't so sure what we believe about it. But here's some of the reality, because not we, we, and we can easily say, you know, that abortion has been foisted on us in Northern Ireland by liberal politicians from Westminster. Yes, that is true. But when the opportunity has been there in our own assembly to, 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 to try to push the tide back, the majority of politicians in our own assembly have also supported abortion on demand up to birth. That's the reality. And here's the awful statistic. Since March of 2020, 2,394 little unborn babies have been killed in Northern Ireland by abortion. 2,394 little ones made in the image of God. Killed by abortion. The current number of deaths by abortion across Britain is about 200,000 per year. Or roughly one in four babies are aborted. Since the 1967 Abortion Act it became law in Great Britain, over 9 million babies' lives have been terminated by abortion. That is such outrageous wickedness. And where else does it lead us to? There are already strong lobby groups pressing for euthanasia to allow the premature ending of people's lives if they are terminally ill or if they suffer from dementia. There are those who have even argued that there's a case to terminate the lives of disabled children after they have been born. My friends, an assembly election campaign has started in Northern Ireland. This is a good question to ask any candidate or any canvasser who knocks your door. Where do you or your candidate or your party stand on the issue of abortion? And if they tell you that the candidate is opposed to abortion, there's another question to ask. If elected, what will you actually do in the assembly when it comes to a vote? Will you vote with your conviction and do everything you can to restrict abortion and to stop it? Or will you meekly bow to the agenda of your party or your party leader? Because this is where Christianity and politics cannot be divorced. The killing of the unborn made in God's image is something that God's word forbids. Now, one final brief point in closing is to see this. The importance of God's image in us being renewed through Christ. We're going to come back to this again in chapter 3 when we look at the fall of man into sin. But for now, it has to be acknowledged that because of sin, the image of God in you or in me is badly marred. And when you see the kind of evil that's committed in the world, by some people, you could say, where is God's image there at all? 
Yet the glorious news of the gospel is that the image of God, ever so marred and ever so twisted by sin, can in us or in anyone be perfectly restored by Jesus Christ. That's what salvation is all about, my friends. By God taking a sinner and making them a new person, recreating them to be like Jesus' son. It's a process God begins when a person comes to Jesus and repents and asks for pardon for their sins. It's a process God will complete one day when he brings a pardoned sinner into glory, into his own presence and makes them perfect in heaven, in Christ. So the ultimate expectation which the Christian possesses is that spoken of by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. There Paul is writing that on the final day of resurrection, the bodies of Christian believers will be raised up into glory. And he states this in verse 49, just as we have borne the image of the man of dust. In other words, just as we are like Adam in his sin. So that day, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. That's Jesus Christ. But my friends, unless by faith in Christ, we possess that promise, we will live only as a shadow of what God wants us to be. And we will die without ever having hope of seeing God's glory. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, Lots of things we have learned from your word this morning. They have touched upon our hearts and lives in many, many places. What we think, what we believe, how we live life, what choices we make. But we pray, Lord God, most of all, that we will see our need of Jesus this morning. Our need of a saviour who rescues from death, who rescues from sin, who restores the, the brokenness of our lives, the ugliness that sin has stained our lives with. Jesus washes away and makes us new. Praise God for it. May people find him today as their all-sufficient saviour. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's sing this hymn. The words may be found familiar to you, but the tune won't be. But I thought this hymn sung, summed up uh, well a lot of what we've been saying this morning bless the lord for all the honors he has granted humankind dignity bestowed upon us work to do with hand and mind <laughs> Us, who alone his likeness share. But we failed the Lord in falling, his own image was defaced. What was good is now appalling, and the steward is raised. Lord, our sin and folly pardon, rectify our lawless reign. Help us tend generations' garden, turn its use to God again. Bless the Lord for new creation. In his image we're restored, joy of reconciliation, sons of God through Christ our Lord. All creation longs for healing, 
groaning, waiting eagerly till the Lord his sons revealing from corruption sets it free. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us this day and forevermore. Amen. Because the, the regulations are so unending, you can still leave the church.